in this next video from War, Art and Visual Culture, London. Max Horton from the University of Arts London chairs a session with three photographers, Thomas Van Hootreff, Palumi Basu and Elethea Casey. I hope you enjoy this video. being here and thanks to Paulo for inviting me to chair this panel and thanks to Kit for organising the whole thing in record time I think. Um, I'm Max Horton, I'm uh, the course leader of uh, MA Photojournalism and Documentary Photography at London College of Communication uh, and I write and curate with photographs. Um, I'm specifically interested in images of conflict um, and I suppose I specialise in the images evidence in international courts. I'm a PhD candidate at UCL at present. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined by, in this rather cosy setup, with these uh, three amazing panellists, all very innovative uh, photographic practitioners, two of whom I'm proud to say study at LCC. Uh, so, Palomi Basu, uh, a transmedia artist and activist who works on social justice issues uh, globally. Uh, she's won many awards for her work, uh, including the Magnum Emergency Fund, and her practice has actually helped change the law uh, in Nepal, which you may talk about later. Um, Lucia Casey, uh, a photographic artist working uh, on historical conflict in Australia, as well as on personal subjects such as her family and her changing role with it. Uh, and she's a, she only, only graduated, was it 2016, Lucia? Oh, it was at the end. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and she's a, a British journal of photography, one to watch, so I'm obeying that. Uh, Thomas Van Hootree, uh, to my right, a Belgian um, photographic artist living in Paris. Um, I'd say his work tends to be about those kind of awkward questions that uh, can't obviously be visualised. Uh, borders, ideologies, surveillance and the like. Uh, he's been working, I think, since 1999 mm -hmm. uh, in photography and has garnered many awards, including the ICP Infinity Award uh, and at least three uh, Pulitzer Awards. Uh, so we'll intersperse the talk um, with presentations from the speakers, I mean at, at the beginning, um, but I just wanted to, to begin with um, the, the title of the talk, which I inherited, thank you, from, from Paul, um, The Edges of Representation. So I just wanted to, um, to sort of give my version of how I think about that, and it made me say, you know, what's the edge? So for me, I guess it's the horizon, it's, it's the limit, it's, it's as far as the eye can see. Um, and the original title for my PhD, obviously it's already changed, um, was Aesthetic Justice. So these were two ideas I wanted to, um, to try to, to work with and to theorise. So I, I was reading uh, Alexander Gottlieb Baumgarten, who used the concept of the horizon to actually affirm aesthetics as its own field of cognition. Um, and he, um, he expects this, his new idea of aesthetics as a philosophical category to be treated in a very unworthy way, that it will be too sensuous, um, it will be a kind of confusion of the passions, and that it's just literally unworthy of photographers. And it's not only that they can't, uh, that they, they think that it's dark and dirty and weird, they can't even see it, they can't see it at all from their lofty position in the clouds. Um, it's a blind spot. So when I thought about what unites these three practitioners, I think that the, um, the aesthetic strategies that they employ help us to, to find our way through the, the blind spots that we all have. So that's what I'd like to suggest that their work helps us to do. And I think that's especially important in, in conflict in relation to what can't be seen. Obviously, there are lots of things that we can see that are immediately uh, visible, but there, there's so much more, um, especially in every technology and the way wars are, um, the wars are waged these days. Well, good service. <laughs> 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 almost, almost seamless. Um, so, Baumgarten designates aesthetics as this field of condition and uh, cognition. Sorry, and he takes a very specific interest in what is dark and confusing. And how he does this is to, to unite the types of cognition, this kind of um, reason, with sensuousness. So he creates a sphere instead of a horizon. Instead of kind of a limit, um, he creates these kind of different, different spaces that come together. And then the question, the kind of philosophical question, becomes less obscured. What, is, what can we see within our horizon? Um, and all of um, these, these people's practices have brought things, um, new things into my, my horizon. Um, in the book called Aesthetic Justice, um, Gerard Brownick says that the aesthetic horizon is capable of shifting and changing the logical horizon, and its task is to expand it. 
And these very expansive practices, they use different kind of technologies, they use different techniques. I think they disrupt our usual vision. Um, so, Tomas, I'm going to make um, a quite literal connection um, between the idea of the horizon to your work, uh, Blue Sky Days, which is um, broadly about a farmer's um, drone program. Um, and I feel like that in situating the drone technology in a kind of American blue skies that you want to, to shift uh, a horizon of, of some kind. And I know you're going to talk us through um, that, that work. Mm -hmm. Great. And another work or just that one? Just that one. Great. Yeah, yeah that would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. So the, yeah, the actual... Um, <coughs> The project that I want to talk about is called Blue Sky Day, so it fits very well with what you were just mentioning. Um, let me just sort of back up and, and show you the, the background that I had uh, before I got to this project. And I want to look at sort of what floats to the top of visual culture on war and the wars that were talked about when I was in university. So this is just a simple Google image search. I've put the words Vietnam War into Google, and this is what pops up, what floats to the top of the internet. And so it's mostly photojournalism. There's some very famous pictures in, in here. This is Kim Phuc, the girl that was hit by napalm and then uh, photographed by the Associated Press photographer, Nick Oot. Um, but you sort of see this broad thing, USGIs, uh, you know, maybe images of war crimes, it looks like happening on the bottom left. You have tabs for memorials, for protests and things like that. So when I was going to school and taking photojournalism classes, this was sort of shown to us as the high point of how you could document a war, and that that documentation uh, would have an impact on policy back home, that somehow the war could be brought home, and that it uh, revealed this disconnect between what the politicians were saying about the war, framing it in the context of the Cold War, or talking about people in terms of numbers and statistics, and then what it actually looked like to a photographer on the ground, and that, that could create empathy or revulsion uh, based on that. So let's go to another war. So how many people here have heard of the Zanzibar War? Raise your hands. All right, we've got one, two, three. This is the most I've ever had because I've never delivered this speech in the UK <laughs> before. So that's great. The Zanzibar War in 1896 was a 45 minute war. So what is amazing to me is that if you just type this into Google image search, you actually get a visual record of it. This is fairly early days in photography when photographic equipment was fairly cumbersome. The war only lasted a very short time and yet you have photographs of ruins and sailors and things like that. So what I want to contrast that with is today where I've put the word drone war into a Google image search, and this is what comes up. And I find this to be an incredibly impoverished visual record. Uh, first of all, the United States' preferred weapon for what they call the war on terror now is the drone. They've been operating for over a decade in at least six countries, so Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, uh, Syria, Iraq, Somalia. There's been thousands of strikes, thousands of casualties, and yet, what you get when you pop this in is sort of, you know, it would make good advertising for, if you were trying to sell drones, the first two images and the bottom two uh, appear to be computer simulations. And you're, you're seeing sort of more of a catalog style product than what uh, we saw in the first slide about Vietnam, where uh, perhaps evidence of war crimes or actually war taking place. So how could this be also when we're living in a time when there are more cameras in the world than ever before, and the world is more connected. It's easier to transmit images more than ever before. And on top of that, the drone is a flying camera and can only achieve strikes and targeting through its camera. So there's a complicity with photography in this. In fact, photography is part of the war-making process with this weapon that's very popular. So I'm going to show you a short video and then uh, I will sort of unpack the project for you a little bit. Thank you. 
operated by the CIA, fired missiles at a suspected militant in Pakistan. see what it looked like from a similar point of view. So this is a photograph of a wedding in Philadelphia. And this is a, a close-up of that image. In 2006, a drone strike on a religious school in the village of Chennai reportedly killed up to 69 Pakistani children. And then this is a schoolyard in California. In 2009, a drone strike on a funeral in South Waziristan reportedly killed 60 Pakistani civilians. And so I photographed uh, in a cemetery in Philadelphia. And then what's interesting about this, and it also echoes what Gilles said a little bit, how is it, how is it that there are all these mistaken <coughs> strikes? Well, this is a quote from Michael Hayden, the former director of the NSA and the CIA. He said openly in a conference, after he stepped down from his position, we kill people based on metadata. So what does that mean? That means that the NSA and the CIA will get a phone tree of all the phones in Pakistan, for example, and then they'll have a very small list of known terrorist suspects, and then they'll see who did those terrorist suspects call. And if one number is called by two or three of the same people, that becomes a suspect number, and they will use that metadata then to kill that person. Now it could be that the same three terrorist suspects called and ordered pizza from the same place, right? So there's a deductive logic, but that's, that is the logic that is used to decide whether somebody will live or die. 
And then the reason that I call this blue sky days was what came from a particular quote. So there was an Afghan boy, 13 years old, in Pakistan, he was in a field outside of his house. Um, his grandmother was picking okra, and all of a sudden, a missile was fired out of the sky and killed her right in front of his eyes. And he was eventually called to Washington, and he testified in front of the US Congress, and this is what he said to Congress. I no longer love blue sky days. In fact, I now prefer gray skies. The drones do not fly when the skies are gray. So this idea that the technology had been created that could make children be terrified or hate blue skies is something that really resonated with me. So that's, that's where the name of this came from. Um, There's another thing that's going on. So there's some publicly released information about the drone war. Right? The US government occasionally releases numbers, at least uh, at the end of the Obama administration, there was some pressure to release numbers of how many people had been killed by drone strikes. But that didn't line up with uh, what the human rights groups were saying about the number of people who were killed. There was a huge gap between them. And one of the things that explains this gap is the accounting method of the death. Whereas the US government, if somebody between the age of 15, 16, and 65, and a male is killed, they are automatically assumed to be a military age male and therefore a combatant. And so they will presume to be a terrorist or terrorist suspect. So in this case, I went to a private military academy in the United States called the Citadel. None of these people are actually in the military, so these are military age males. And then the last point I want to bring up today on this subject is that there is a slippage of this technology from the battlefield into the domestic space. So not only is the US military has pioneered this in the last decade and then it's spreading to other militaries around the world, um, but also then the predator drones are being brought back to the United States. So there's a fleet of 12 predators that fly over the US, Canada, and US, Mexico borders as part of this scheme, uh, before Trump started talking about his wall, Bush and Obama put billions of dollars into what they called the virtual fence, which is this network where you use uh, camera towers, ground sensors, and aerial drones to target and apprehend migrants that are trying to cross the border. So I feel like there's also uh, a way that photography is complicit in uh, these practices as part of the militarization of the space. So I also took some images, I extended this project last year and then went to the, the US-Mexico border and took aerial drone photos there. This is the main crossing point from Tijuana uh, into San Isidro's San Diego area and the line in the very middle of it is the US-Mexican border. And then the black line in the middle is the current U.S.-Mexican border wall. And what you see above are Trump's eight prototypes of uh, walls that he wants to have built. So I'm going to leave it there for today so that there is enough time for everybody else. Thanks so much. by uh, Blue Skies is the perfect title, Blue Sky Days is the a really evocative title um, for this. Paul Virilio, um in his War and Cinema Logics, uh, Logistics of Perception book um, points out about the, uh, the amazing power of propaganda. Um, one, day, uh, one year sorry, after um, Hiroshima, Fred Astaire was dancing uh, in Hollywood and, and singing Nothing But Blue Skies, I'll spare you the rendition. Um, but uh, Virilio says that he really hijacks the spectator's gaze through pure fascination. And I feel like with your film, I thought that the use of music was really, really effective and compelling. And it's this, I felt like you were operating a kind of counter-propaganda here um, in relation to, you know, it, it, you really kept us, our, our emotional sort of kind of center with the use of, of music as well as that kind of imagery. I mean, I, I'm sure you weren't relating it to, to kind of Fred Astaire and, and singing Nothing But Blue Skies, but could you tell me about the use of music there? Well, I mean, let's say the m use of music or multimedia in general. So I come from a still photography background, but that's a, a multimedia piece. But part of that was sort of a reaction that 
war is done through multimedia with this with the drone basically you have people sitting <laughs> thousands of miles away from what we consider the battlefield who are participating in combat through screens uh, listening to chatter and uh, also listening to voices on the ground it could be you know uh, soldiers that are operating around the ground or uh, spies and other agencies that are analyzing their video basically and and this the main base for this happens outside of Las Vegas Nevada and yeah. so they'll sort of check in do their multimedia warfare during the day and then clock out at the end of the day go and pick up their kids from school go do some shopping and and go home um, and so I think this false like you specifically reference propaganda what's interesting about the drone war is that it it's, it's more like there's an information vacuum. If you talk about previous wars, it was like you have this competing narrative, the propaganda on this side, perhaps the media pushing another thing on this side, and then maybe if you can get other kinds of testimony or people speaking up, and all these informations are, are pushing back and forth across each other. What I felt like was with the drone war, sort of you're not getting any of it. You're not getting US propaganda <coughs> about how wonderful drones are. Um, and you're not getting much uh, media coverage either because of the inaccessibility of the topic. Um, uh, the, the reason that just sort of the short video uh, with music was chosen was just to sort of try to grab people's attention, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Like, how can I get yeah. people who, who don't know about this? And it, it, I don't think many people are going to sit down and read <coughs> through 400 drone exactly. strike reports. So you have to sort of grab them and get them interested yeah. in this subject. That's yeah. exactly what yeah. you've done. The, the choice of music, what, did, what is it? Uh, that, so that was, I mean, this was edited um, in, in cooperation with National Geographic. It was uh, a video producer at National Geographic that found this music mm. and a few other samples of music and that we agreed on this one. Mm. But I felt it just sort of carried an emotional tension and, mm. and ambiguity. And then with the video itself, what I was trying to do is that people wouldn't initially know if this was shot from a U.S. military drone. And then eventually you start to see cheerleaders and American flags and it becomes quite clear that this isn't uh, happening in a foreign space, it's happening in a domestic space for, for Americans basically, so to throw them through that loop basically. Yeah, no, it's very sophisticated use of technologies. Um, thanks for that. More, more from um, Thomas uh, soon, of course. Um, but to, to move along to um, Alethea, um, back to my idea of, of shifting the horizon um, and advancing what we can know and see. Um, in some of your images from your work about the, the Bathurst War um, and about Tasmania, it actually really looks to me like that's what you're doing. In some of the way that the, the images look like, it looks like the horizon has, has shifted um, with the interventions that you make with how you disrupt uh, the image. And I mentioned to you earlier, I, um, your work, I find your work very visceral. It kind of hits me here, and, and Anithia said that's because that's where it comes from. Um, and I think this emotional uh, kind of connection to the work and your, um, your very visceral uh, dis disruption of the imagery itself um, is, is really fascinating and compels a particular kind of attention. Would you like to show yeah, us your absolutely. work? Thank you. Sorry. We might go through it a few times. 
I'll start off with a quote um, from a wonderful journalist, um, Stan Grant. He wrote a book, um, in, in, as one of his quotes, he says, Australia still can't decide whether we were settled or invaded. We have no doubt. Our people died defending their land, and they have no doubt. Stan Grant's a Wiradjuri man from the area where I grew up, actually, which is inland Australia. Who was that? Let's go back. Which is inland New South Wales. I grew up in the 80s and 90s in a time when there was absolutely no mention of the frontier wars in the colonisation of Australia. There was no mention of the violence which had occurred. There was only talk of explorers settling this wild and untamed land of Terenulius, as it was stated. The narrative told of the, of the greatness of the British explorers who tamed this incredible vast land, and there was absolutely no acknowledgement of Aboriginal history, of the achievements of Aboriginal people, which is fundamentally creating this nation state which glorified its former, former um, self coming from Britain and absolutely disqualified everything from the Indigenous people of Australia. In the late 1960s, the anthropologist W.H. Stanner wrote about a culture of disremembering. Stanner said in his lectures for the Australian Broadcasting Commission that in Australia we have honoured a silence which he coined the Great Australian Silence, which was not only a silencing on the telling of an alternative history, but also a silencing of Indigenous voices as well. He said, we have been able for so long to disremember the Aborigines. He called it a cult of forgetfulness practiced on a national scale. Up until this point, Australia had had a little discourse in the mainstream media in regard to the conflicts and wars which occurred during the early days of colonisation and settlement. The Tasmanian historian Henry Reynolds wrote, the big question hovering above all of these matters is whether the settlers and Aborigines were at war or not. The reluctance of many people to accept the reality of a long but persistent war leaves only one other, infinitely more challenging alternative. If there was no war, then thousands of Aborigines were murdered in a century-long, continent-wide crime wave that was tolerated by government. There seems to be no other option. It was <coughs> one or the other. One of the sharpest debates in regard to frontier conflict and frontier wars is arguably in the island state of Tasmania, which is right down the bottom of Australia, as you probably know where it is. The frontier violence in Tasmania and the war which ensued was brutal and swift between the years of 1803 and 1831. These conflicts and the eventual so-called Black War was a guerrilla war but of massive proportions for both sides of the conflicts for the new settlers and for the indigenous population. Historian Nicholas Clements argues that in this conflict, the death per capita was a very small population, but the death per capita for Aborigines and first settlers alike was higher than in any other war that Australia has fought, including all of those wars that it has since fought abroad. He argues that roughly one third of the indigenous population was killed during massacres and frontier violence during this time. This photographic work uses the conflicts and subsequent war of the frontier in Tasmania as a backdrop to examine the notion of deliberate historical forgetting. I focus on the massacre sites which are scattered throughout the island of Tasmania and photographed indigenous Tasmanians as well to reflect on bloodlines, the importance of attachment to place and how people are attached to their land and landscape. The images aim at visually uncovering, uncovering hidden atrocities through the disfigured and manipulated landscapes, which were always the sites of conflicts and massacres. The series uses overlaid photographs combined with fine art from the artist John Glover, who was practicing in Tasmania around the 1830s at the end of this conflict 
and who produce these amazingly beautiful scenes of idyllic, lovely, soft, lit scenes of Aboriginal people going about their daily life and absolutely led no, didn't tell um, about the, the conflicts that was happening around this exact time during that period where he was painting the light and highly European paintings that he produced and really ignores this harsh light that Australia has, which is completely unlike that of the light in Europe. While I was producing this work, I asked myself a lot of questions. One of the most important things, I think, to consider as a non-Indigenous person, as a non-Indigenous Australian producing this work, is do I have the right to talk about this? Do I have the right to talk about these past conflicts? Do I have the right to talk about Indigenous history, since I am not Indigenous? And I actually don't know my personal history. A lot of Australians don't. I find in many colonised countries, we, as a nation, we've evolved to only look forwards. We have really denied the idea of looking back into our past and only look forwards and only praise modernisation and the future in this positive outlook that we have, which silenced the past almost entirely. While considering all of these questions, I also asked myself about my own moral sense of culpability. It's a question I, I still haven't answered. Do I have the right to talk about these things? And where do I fit <coughs> into this picture? As Henry Bailey says, do the descendants of pioneering generations inherit moral culpability for events that unfolded long before they were born? <coughs> I think it's a really important question to reflect upon when producing this type of work. While I was producing this work, I photographed Eliza, who was the first person that we see here, who's a good friend of mine and who I collaborate, I've collaborated with in another, um, another series I've produced. And while we were photographing, Eliza suggested that we paint her face with ochre taken from Tasmania, which was used in traditional women's ceremonies. Those photographs I didn't feel were the strongest in the series. But I loved the idea of this ochre, this continually changing material that came from the earth and came from these actual sites that had witnessed trauma within the landscape. Eliza had the permission of the elders to take this material from the earth and she gave me some. And so I started to use this ochre to paint over the photographic slides. And so through this cracking and revealing and continually changing material, I'm aiming to talk about how history is continually changing, our understanding of history is continually evolving, and it's continually moving and shifting, much like memory. through the negative, sometimes with fingernails, sometimes with other materials that I found on site and which had permission from the elders to remove like sticks and tweets and other things. This is Christine who is Eliza's aunt. Every person in this series is related. They're Eliza's aunts, uncles, nephews and so they're all within the same bloodline. This is Wisdom Cove. Some of you may have heard of this, this massacre site. It's a highly contested area. This is with a painting of Don Glover. And again, overlays of photographs. For the series, I also used photograms of my own hair, which is my own way of imprinting my own personal trace onto the canvas. Because we talk about responsibility and culpability and whether those things in fact are even useful to think about, but I think they're incredibly important to think about how we relate to this. Where does my personal family history come from? Is my personal family history involved in this? This is something that none of us like to think about. It's incredibly uncomfortable to even consider it, but of course people were, and this is where most of us came from, um, my great grandfather, so great great grandfather, moved to Australia from Ireland on one side, and the other side, absolutely no knowledge of. And so these images, as Max was talking about before, they they're actually very personal because it's questioning, it's questioning my place, questioning my place in this landscape and where I fit. 
into the history of Australia, where my family perhaps fit into this conflict, which of course happened all throughout Australia, as massively occurred throughout the entire country during the early days of colonisation. This, this um, particular image here is with ochre that I re-scanned later on. So I scanned it at one particular point and then I scanned it several weeks later and the ochre had changed. And each time I re-scanned it, it produced a different image. So again, talking about this, this idea of memory, of how memory is multi-layered and how depending on our perspective, we will always have a different memory of certain events. When we think about our childhood, perhaps when we think about when we're five years old, when we thought about that event when we were 10, it's going to be different to how we see and think about that event right now. This is Peter, who's actually one of the stolen generations as well, as an indigenous Tasmanian, that was removed from his mother when he was very young. And this is Bunny Island, which is Eliza's home. Um, and this has particular significance, of course, to Eliza because Trevor is an incredibly well-known indigenous Australian comes from this island which is just below the rest of um, Tasmania and was in a sense a freedom fighter for indigenous rights. Before I finish up, that's almost there. And I just want to show you quite quickly my original concept when I was thinking about photographing these sites. When I originally wanted to photograph this series, I wanted to go up and photograph the massacre sites in a very straightforward way to talk about how the land might bear witness to atrocity, how it might, might somehow contain the pain and the trauma of the past. And so I went to these different sites and I photographed all throughout Tasmania. But for me, it lacked, it lacked that emotional punch that I wanted. And as I started to continue to work on and look at the images, I realized that I had to physically distort them. I had to physically manipulate and change them. Much of our history has been manipulated. It's been changed. Certain aspects of it have been revealed and other aspects hidden. So to do my images, they needed to, un they needed to reveal. They needed to work through and scratch through. <coughs> they needed to change and distort this regular photographic process. And so these are my early images where I'm working through the layers, working through the layers of memory, working through the layers of this narrative of history, which of course is always going to be multi-layered. There's no one single truth ever. And so I needed to change and disfigure the landscapes very much as history has done. I've got time quickly enough to show the other series. Where we are. I think the time you That's okay. Um, yeah, just a minute or so. Excellent. From that particular series, um, um, I've now been commissioned by a gallery in Bathurst to produce a similar series focusing on the massive mass 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 sites throughout the area of Bathurst, which if any of you know Australia is over the Blue, Blue Mountains, so from Sydney onwards over the Blue Mountains into a um, really farmland area, which is the area of the Wiradjuri people, not all that far from where I grew up. In 1824, <coughs> there was a war in this region, which again is a war which is fairly unknown, even amongst Australians, <coughs> and massacre sites are dotted all around this area. using similar techniques as in the Tasmanian series. I'm aiming at talking about, again, about weakness, about how the land contains this physical quality from the past, how the land, just like all of us, continue to live the past within the present. John Burge has a beautiful quote about how we all wear the past next to our skin like a layer of linen. So it's very much like linen that takes on the shape and the scent of our bodies as well. And that our past is very much the same. 
And so this series is talking about how our history has made us, obviously, who we are now, and how the landscape has been there to witness this. I'm using cyanotypes in some of these images, overlaid over the actual landscapes. Um, I'm working with the Wiradjuri elders in the area who are producing their own cyanotypes as well to talk about their own personal histories. And to finish, I'll, I'll quote Stan Grant again, who says, the past is alive in me now. Its wounds rest deep and uneasily in our soul. I am the sum of many things, but I am all history. And we are trapped in this history, all of us. <coughs> and if we don't understand it, we will remain chained to it. And I'll finish up there. Thank you. Um, I was struck by uh, what you said about when you were growing up in the 80s and 90s, there was just nothing about these wars. And it really uh, reminds me of why um, W.G. Sebald uh, wrote, because when he was growing up in post-war Germany, so pre-Holocaust studies, etc., there was nothing about the war and the fact that his own father was stationed in Poland in 1939. And that's why he wrote, and all of his work was about not forgetting. And it's just, I thought that the idea about what is available to you in your very own episteme, to use a Tricoldian term, but just, you know, in your period, I think we're so influenced by, by that, you know, the bit that we know in that important time, and then it will sort of unfold later, but we can't ever forget that first period. That's just a, an observation. But my question actually is about, I've actually had the privilege of seeing your work sort of in real life, not just on the screen, and the materiality um, of the photograph seems, um, I mean, it's wonderful to see it like this, but it seems um, essential in a way to attain the full visceral power of that. I wondered if you might talk about the, you know, the, the real violence of what happened there and um, comes to the fore even more when you see it in real life. And I just wondered what you think about the, the tension between uh, the materiality of the photograph or it being always kind of on a screen mm. when most people will see it on the screen. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's so true. Um, I work really intuitively, so it's a really intuitive way of working. I don't know when I'm going to stop, I don't know when it's finished or when it's enough. Um, but I work with film, um, not because it's in fashion again, it's tr sorry, it's trendy, but um, because I suppose as well, because of those layers. Because with film you have the layers, you know, you have the red, green, blue, or, or like, it would slide, or I guess with, with Ned, another layer of orange as effectively. But actually, as you scratch through it, you can see the different layers as well. So you can actually see these different elements of color when you manipulate and change and damage a negative. And so that's really important, I guess, this idea of damaging um, and of leaving your own mark. So it's not just this impermanent mark that you can always change um, and go back to, it's actually a permanency. It's, it's, it's permanent trauma. And I suppose that's, in a sense, what I'm actually getting at that this trauma, the trauma of colonization that we've failed to acknowledge is a permanent trauma. And often it's seen as, oh, it was so long ago, it was you know, something we just need to get over and move on from. But actually, it's still much like the, the marking of a negative and the damaging of a negative. It's still very much lived. It's still very much there. And you know, it's, not, it's not going away just kind of by not talking about it. And do, do you think that, um, and would you, every time you did a talk, would you rather that you were able to show your, show your work, I mean, the, the actual materiality of the, the object? Of the mm, that would actually be I've never done a talk and actually showed it, wouldn't it be the medium format there, yeah. so they're yeah. relatively small, but actually that could be quite nice. Yeah, um, I think sometimes we just, that just a little is, is lost in translation when you mm. can't actually see the, the photograph itself because we're so used to seeing things on the screen. Mm. I think it changes the experience. Mm. So true. But thank you. More, more from you soon. Um, so Colleen has been gently sipping her tea. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the nature of the conflicts that you um, are working on, uh, Colleen, are, are very contemporary. Um, and you often work with extremely uh, contemporary technology, not least uh, VR. Um, and one of the two works that you're going to show today is Centralia work. You kind of created this sort of sci-fi um, mode, I think, to or the sci-fi aesthetic as a record of this little understood war that you're going to tell us all about in India, um, where you've at least in part been immersed with Maoist insurgents. Um, and as so often with your work, you have a specific focus on women. Um, so I don't know which elements you're going to 
to talk about, but is there anything you want to pick up on or would you just like to, to make your, your presentation? Um, I just show some of my background, where I right. come from and why I... Um, sorry, hi everyone, I'm Polumi, I'm from Calcutta, India. So I'm just going to show some of my background, Great. why I obviously journeyed on this path I did and mm -hmm. what made me go into these places or choose some narratives and stories that I wanted to tell, especially stories that are reported and they're all also very personal. So again, it's personal, it's the political. So. And I think you change the technology and the aesthetic for every story that you do. It never yeah, so I work with a lot of new, I'm a new media practitioner really. So I use, uh, I work with film, I work with virtual reality, I work with uh, video, I work with uh, multiple exposures. I, I kind of change new technology and, and I use uh, different forms of media within one project so that each form of media brings new audiences. Mm -hmm. So that's really my aim, is to get as many as audiences I can feel to a particular story, and I don't feel, and I don't find that one form of representing a, a story is the right way of doing it, because I think any story has a multiplicity of voices, and I think it's really the collision of all these different voices that helps you arrive to an idea of what the truth is about a story, so I think different media mm -hmm. sort of help you do that. Mm -hmm. And again, they attack, attack different audiences, and I think as a contemporary practitioner, it's really important you think about your audience, because um, we're not, photography is such a small niche world, you know, the book world is even smaller. Yeah. So, I mean, how can you expand your audience? How can you make impact with your work? And I, I'm also a human rights activist, so a lot of my work has got to do a lot with impact. I try to get as much impact as I can with my work. You know, as with Blood Speaks, one of the earlier works I did, I ended up changing a law in Nepal against uh, menstrual exile with a lot of pressure that I put with the different uh, forms uh, in the work I did. So, I mean, um, so yeah, maybe I get to show some Shows of Shows your work. work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you.
skirmishes of the past months have reminded us this border remains a tinderbox box of tension. And within this pressurized environment, these women, largely from, from impoverished rural areas, putting on a uniform was like coming out of their own skin. They saw it as a way of gaining some form of independence. Otherwise, they usually get married early or because they're seen as an additional burden to pay. So for them, coming into the border, was, it, it's astonishing that within the military life is more of giving them a greater independence than a, a, a family life. Their patriarchal bonds were broken. They belonged to the army, the border. With To Conquer Her Land, I wasn't interested in war per se. I was looking to explore something deeper and much more complex. Something on the periphery, something hinted at, something in mood and nuance. Documenting the specifics of skirmishes or military intervention doesn't really tell us what is going on. We would perhaps be documenting the status quo, concentrating on the narrative that those in power would prefer we cover. To go deeper, to explore the role of war, conflict, geopolitics, formation of identity is to dig deeper and begin asking much more fundamental questions of ourselves as a society. I just want to touch a little bit upon my uh, practice in this work. I use 35 mm and medium format as well as a mixed color and black and white images to sort of manipulate past and present. So what you see in black and white is the past, which is gray, and a life which is bleak and in the border, whereas the color is the moment of more, uh, a time of love and contentment than the past. And um, I also use, typically my intention was to break the binary of traditional representation to use different formats so to, to present multiplicity of voices as usual. Throughout my work, I have become increasingly concerned with the exoticization of narratives from the majority world and have developed a methodology that takes a variety of hybrid forms to reject static notions of identity and gazes beyond the jungle book. I will go on to develop this approach in my forthcoming book, Centralia, a complex narrative encompassing many characters and narrative elements. Approaching within the strict confines of documentary or journalism wasn't an option for me. I wanted to strip away from the conflict's specificity to reveal its essential character and also demonstrate how the story of this conflict is very much a universal narrative. I'm just going to play a small video. Centralia is a tale of fractured landscape in its strengths, the shifting planes of reality, and India of the mind, a place both hyperreal and metaphorical, familiar yet alien. These are strange times for reality. The deeper we are entangled in the era of close truth, the more malleable both it and our own perceptions become. We no longer believe our own eyes, seeing only what we already believe. 
portraying what the truth is of a situation you know so and I think with for journalism and document and for journalism specifically is quite obsessed with the idea of truth and when you're working in a conflict like this or working in a stories like this there, are, there is no truth is the first casualty of any war so like how do you then explain a story that has multiple points of view and multiple versions of truth and I think that is so I decided to turn this upon myself in the project and play, interrogate that and help the audience interrogate those different entry points and you know into the project and sort of try and understand and play with those different variety of truths and lies to understand and come to some form of an understanding through the collision of multiple perspectives. And I think that's what I'm trying to get at with most of the work I do, sort of question the practice itself and turn it upon myself to see then how we can play with different forms and play with different entry points and play with different voices within a particular body of work to then give the audience a somewhat understanding of what the story might be. Because as we know, there is no one way to tell a story and there is no one story. So. Mm. No, thank you. Thomas, just would you like to speak to that question? 
To the first question about complexity, or the um, well, actually, I, I meant, um, do you think that your methods um, sort of test the, the veracity of the medium in which you're you're working? Uh, I mean, I got to these methods not because uh, that I had this fundamental questioning of, of the failings of, of truth used as like an objective of journalism, uh, but it was, but it was more like. Uh, um, sort of where images fell off the map. So sort of uh, the fringes where we, the way I tend to look at things is, what is our existing mental picture of the world, right? So what is the visual landscape we have in our heads? Where is that distorted by stereotypes and misinformation? And where does it sort of fall off on the fringes? And so the areas that I'm interested in working on and areas is where I can uh, subvert stereotypes that are in our heads, or I can fill in the fringes where we have nothing at all. And so it's the edges of representation. That that it is the edges that of representation in that sense. So I, I felt like the drone war is something uh, that we are involved in and complicit in if we live in societies where we pay taxes to supposedly democratic governments, and so this happens as our name, um, and yet there's not an awareness of it and that there is this traditional role that photography has brought awareness to people in times of conflict, so maybe this could be used again. Um, that, that's, that's sort of how I got to it. As far as like the answer of complexity, uh, you know, Simon mentioned in the earlier discussion how sometimes the research that you do becomes too heavy of a weight to bear for a photograph. Uh, so a lot of my projects, I'll just do so much research and often, I go off into the world sort of not knowing something, and that's the original yeah. impulse for why I get obsessed with it, and so I investigate, investigate, dig up information, and then you have this huge amount of information, and then it has to be squeezed down into a photograph or an exhibition or a publication. Uh, but I hope that it's sort of like a window. You know, everything that I learned is like squeezed into this window, and I'm hoping a few people will jump through that window. It's a starting place, but from there, hopefully it will uh, ignite their curiosity to do some of that same research themselves. I think people have to take an active role themselves and be engaged. I don't think there's much you can spoon feed people about a war at the end of the day. People have to sort of be responsible, but you can give them a little kick to get started. That's interesting. You know, more like well, Alethea in, in terms of either, either complexity or, or veracity in, in your methods. Um, well, I guess as as I, I consider myself um, I guess a crossover between documentary and fine art photography, and I suppose at the moment particularly we're all quite obsessed with truth in photojournalism, uh, because we perceive that photo editing software is easy to make um, changes with, although I, my perception is that the dark room used to be quite easy as well to make lots of changes to imagery and was always used to do that as well through photo retouching by hand or in the dark room. Um, when it comes to truth in imagery, um, I like to obviously distort the truth. So, so, so it's such, a, such an obvious distortion that there can be absolutely no, uh, no doubt. Nobody can be agreeing whether this is truthful or not because it's my perception. It's a very personal perception. And again, it comes down to emotion because really, is there any truth in emotion? You know, it's, it's always just one perspective. Um, and so my work is kind of emotional. And so I guess that ties into that idea that, that there is really no truth, in a sense, because it's just using the basis of emotion to, to talk about... If the, if the body knows. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. It's like, yes. it's our intuition, yeah. which is um, coming from a place of, of deep emotion. Um, so I guess it's that multi-layered aspect to it when we talk about emotion. Um, and complexity, absolutely, I think. Um, this is why I love, I love still imagery, actually, because I, I think you can have great complexity because it's up to us as the viewer to, to view it for 10 seconds or to view it for 10 minutes or 10 hours and we can see varying layers of complexity in the still image and what I love that as the viewer we have control over, we have the power as we look at that image and as we, we soak it in and we, we can involve ourselves within the viewing of that image and that's why well, for me I, I love still imagery so much um, and I love reworking imagery because there's that sense of I guess I'm in, I'm in control of when to stop and, and when to stop that reworking and that changing um, of that image. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we're quite short of uh, time, so I'm just going to ask one more thing and then open it out. But just about um, that, we said that we might talk about uh, empathy. Um, I noticed uh, that on um, 
my research into Thomas, you said that that's one of your desires, that your work uh, brings about a kind of empathy in, in the people who look at it, and I wondered what, if you'd like to speak um, about that, and if um, Polly and Olivia, uh, if that's a concern of, of yours too. Um, yeah, well, I think my probably empathy is something that I'm looking for. I think that the machinery of government in the state doesn't necessarily have empathy built into it. I feel like a lot of the tools that have been built by the information revolution, data doesn't have empathy built into it. Um, what are the things that can put a break on war that can slow it down? There aren't that many things. You can sort of run out of resources, you can be defeated, but I also think empathy can play a role to put a check on warlike impulses that, that have shown up again and again in human society. Um, and so, yeah, some of my work I'm trying to break through uh, abstraction or data or policy and find a point of empathy. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, empathy plays a big role in, in all the work I have done, and in my past, especially with Love Speaks, you know, it's, it's, it's been important, but this is a different kind of project, you know, I mean, for me, it's really important that these, the, 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 it's the first iteration of this work is going to be a book, because it's almost like an investigative object. Central the work around, yeah. yes, because it's really important that the work is out in the world, and just, because nobody knows what is going on here, you know, in this particular region of India. Like, very few people are actually there reporting. But Do you see it as a form of evidence? Even it's sort of, yeah. yeah, it is. And the only other person I know who's been here and reported from here is Arunuti Roy, you know, and I've met her, and she's the only other person. Like, so, it's really, I mean, for me, it's almost like the empathy will be a second stage to this. Right. Like, there are stages. First, there has to be the knowledge. First, there has to be the knowledge. Right. There has to, the work has to go out in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, you can start the empathy. But of course, the work in itself has, like, I, 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 I agree with her. Like, I, I think there is a beauty to uh, still photography. Like, it can, mm -hmm. so it can slow you down. It can, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's, it's a big body of work. And once you see it in its full form, I think it's, uh, I think it's personally, mm -hmm. it's moving and it can trigger empathy. Thanks. And in, in terms of a, a much more historical uh, conflict, is that still something that you would hope to arouse? I mean, is there still a, a, a kind of pu is there a pushback in Australia? I mean, I don't I don't know the contemporary mm -hmm. politics there uh, against um, you know first people against. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. Well, that I mean that's just, that's actually a big part of why I, I do the work I do. That I've lived for about twelve years between London and I've gone back to Sydney several years before I to London. I keep doing that. Um, and I'm, I'm really shocked actually when I go back to Australia and a lot of the, the views that are still held. Um, and so a huge part of this work actually is about talking about it because a lot of people still won't, don't know about this research about massacre sites. Um, this work should be published in The Guardian, I think, at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to people about that, they say, well, massacre sites in Australia, you know, no, that, that didn't happen. And so, and so there's this great fear about talking about it because we haven't been exposed to it or aware of our history um, and and so yes I think it's only really through empathy that you can make people understand um, what's yeah. happened and then understand that trauma is an ongoing thing and trauma is relived through generations and it's really only through empathy that that can make any positive change which ultimately the work is is aiming at doing that. Yeah mm -hmm. thank you um, yeah, and I'm afraid as they sometimes say that's all we have time for and um, thanks so much for listening and thanks to the amazing panelists thank you. Thank you.